This is Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. It's powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To start your free 14-day trial, visit shopify.com. Hey, entrepreneurs, my name is Felix, and I'm the host of the Shopify Masters podcast. Each week, we put out podcast interviews with successful e-commerce entrepreneurs or experts to give you inspiration, motivation, and actionable tips to increase your traffic and sales so your store can generate the sales you need to live the life you want. In the last episode, you'll learn how abookapart.com built a business with a 100% remote team. On today's podcast, you'll learn from an entrepreneur that successfully raised nearly $400,000 through crowdfunding and why he thinks established brands should not crowdfund. In this episode, you'll learn how they use Kickstarter to come up with their own product idea, how they A-B test their Facebook ads, and when to use Facebook ads and when to use Instagram ads. Today, I'm joined by Daniel Kane from RidgeWallet.com. RidgeWallet sells slim RFID blocking minimalist wallets, and it was started in 2013 and based out of Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks, Felix. So tell us a little bit more about your story and what are what is the most popular product that you sell? Yeah, so um, our main product, we try to keep it pretty streamlined, is just a uh, front pocket RFID blocking wallet and uh we kind of stick with the same design across the product line. Basically, they come in different material choices and colors. And um, we started it back on Kickstarter in 2013 and had a really good campaign and kind of spun that off and do a standalone e-commerce business on Shopify. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So uh, what is your background? How did you get involved into you know, creating products, uh, launching a Kickstarter and e-commerce? Have you done entrepreneurial things in the past? Yeah, so I started, I was back in college when we ran the Kickstarters. Um, And I've always been kind of interested in entrepreneurship and just starting businesses and kind of like random stuff here and there, uh, kind of back in high school and earlier in college and just kind of kept building on that. And I always enjoyed kind of how things worked and business in general and something eventually just kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm looking at the wallets now. Anyone else listening out there, definitely check it out. It's uh, most wallets I see are, you know, fabric or leather. And, but this is not, those things, they're like actually like, you know, pretty, I guess, hard looking, I'm not sure a good, better way to describe it, but solid pieces of, of wallets. How did you know that there was a market for this, uh, this style of wallet? Yeah, well, at, at the time, there were similar things on the market. And me and my dad were actually, like the idea kind of came about because we had uh, actually contributed to another Kickstarter. And I thought it was the rich. But then when we looked at it a little closer, it ended up being just um, basically just a piece of elastic. Mm. So we kind of thought like comparing what was available and what kind of we wanted, we definitely thought there was room to kind of improve that kind of general basis. So we knew that people kind of wanted a design like that, but I just didn't quite like anything available. So um, yeah, we decided to kind of, we had a set of criteria and we went about just kind of designing the product around that. Yeah, I like this. So you had uh, bought or backed uh, a Kickstarter campaign previously thinking that there was a product out there already that met your needs or what you wanted. You got the product and it didn't meet your needs. So you decided to credit yourself. Uh, So what was, I guess, the first step? You know, you said you had a list of criteria first before you, I guess, dove into this. Can you tell us a little bit about what those, uh, I guess, uh, criteria were? And then how did you come up with the criteria and like the features, I guess, that you wanted in your, in your version? of the wallet yeah sure so um there are a lot of like minimalist wallets out there and most of them kind of revolve around there's two different types of designs the first design is basically just two plates with like an elastic band around it just one tension spot on the um on either side and i didn't really like that how it could kind of come apart what if the elastic slides off your card could kind of go flying um so i wanted an extra retention band that was also included within the design so something that couldn't just like be simply like pulled apart or get snagged on something and kind of like break into pieces. So we have, that was the first design criteria was I wanted a uh, three retention band. So the elastic, if you look at the wallet on the sides and the bottom, kind of keeping the, the elastic in or keeping the cards in. And um, we also wanted it to be modular so you can kind of replace parts as you go. So it's kind of like if you want to add a money clip or take away a money clip or um, mm-hmm. kind of personalize it over time, you'll have that option of buying like replacement parts. But yeah, that was basically the main one was just um, 
modular RFID and kind of coming up with a one piece design, something that seemed a little more, um, a little more complete. I don't know. A lot of the wallets I saw just, they didn't seem like something you'd actually want to like carry around. Mm-hmm. So I wanted something that was more of like a one piece design. No, that makes sense. So this, uh, how whole kind of RFID blocking technology that, you know, comes in your, you know, tagline and you mentioned it a couple of times and it's on your Kickstarter page. How did you know that this was something that you should target? You know, because when I have purchased wallets in the past or shopped around for it, I, you know, I haven't, I guess, been in the market for a long time for wallets, but it's not something that crosses my mind initially to, to release, I guess, if I were to release a product to emphasize RFID blocking aspect of it. How did you know that that was a feature that you should kind of put front and center with your product? RFID is something I've kind of heard about before. I know like uh, the Mythbusters guys had tried to run like a segment on RFID and kind of how prevalent skimmers were in the industry, which is like people being able to kind of wirelessly grab all your credit card info um, from like contact cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was kind of also inherently just if you have a, a wallet made of aluminum, it's just going to have RFID blocking capabilities. So like that was just sort of, if we wanted the, the initial design we made, just kind of, that was a byproduct, just happened to be RFID blocking. And that is something that I had people in my personal life kind of like talk about and ask about before. So um, it's just sort of a nice added benefit that just like, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's say uh, you had decided that this was a, a product that you wanted to create. You guys figured out the criteria and the features that you wanted to include in it. What was the first step? Was it just to launch a Kickstarter campaign or did you do further research before you got to that step? Yeah, we pretty much just went straight to the Kickstarter. Uh, I had um, <clears throat> a metal manufacturer in the US that I had worked with in the past back in high school. I was like, prototyping some drums. Um, so I had a guy kind of close to my hometown that uh, I'd worked with in the past who could do some prototypes. And once we kind of come up with the idea and we had uh, something kind of tangible, we made some drawings and made a little, I uh, actually made something out of some credit cards, kind of cut them up and glued them together, something to kind of show the guy. He made uh, the first couple samples out of aluminum and stainless steel. And that was kind of nice to get the first kind of iteration kicked off and we were able to send that over to a manufacturing partner I had in China that they kind of built on the design and improved it. And so that was pretty easy to kind of have something physical made here and then kind of send it over there to be improved on. Mm, So you had a prototype that you made locally first and then it made it easier to work with the manufacturers overseas in China because you already had something physical to show them for them to take a look at. Like, what did you want to get out of them? Like a quote? Because again, this was previous this is prior to launching on kickstarter right you're just kind of doing some yeah. initial research yeah but i also wanted to find a manufacturer kind of before i made any promises on kickstarter hmm. so our current manufacturer we're working with today was the one who made the first prototypes for kickstarter um so he's been awesome we've kept working with him over the years and uh he's been really good to help improve the design and initially saying it over there was um could, we couldn't really find anyone to like unless you were like really like looking to spend a lot of money, which we didn't have at the time to get some like serious prototypes done in the U S uh, would have been like really, really expensive. So we got some kind of crude prototypes done where it's like the basic shape and layout. And it was all like the kind of basic CNC work. And then, uh, in China, they kind of took that design and improved it and polished it up and got us some good samples we could work with. Okay, so you already had some samples initially before launching on Kickstarter, because I'm trying to get an idea of like how much preparation, based on your experience, how much preparation should a Kickstarter, uh, I guess, campaign creator do, especially for a physical product, prior to you know launching uh, their campaign? Yeah, I mean, a lot of Kickstarter campaigns tend to uh, fall behind schedule. Uh, it's a pretty common theme in all the projects, just yeah. the stuff just takes longer than you expect. And so that's kind of why I decided I think it's good to have at least the physical samples because you need to be able to show pictures and the video and stuff like that. And um, beyond that, I preferred to have the manufacturing partner kind of set up before launching the Kickstarter. Some people like to kind of do that afterwards, but um, I wanted to really make sure the campaign went smoothly and we had like, I knew I could get it made somewhere. 
Yeah, I think that's um, a great idea to kind of have everything ready to go, hit, uh, uh, you know, hit, hit the ground running once you do have a successful campaign. So um, let's talk a little bit about the Kickstarter campaign. So I'm looking right now at your Kickstarter profile, and the Rich Wallet was not your first uh, Kickstarter campaign. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so talk, talk to us a little bit about your, your experience, your initial experience um, launching a Kickstarter. I see here uh, the Enclave Eyewear. Tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, so Enclave was actually um, started a sunglass company before the Ridge, and that was maybe six months before. Uh, it was something I'd always kind of been interested in. It was like kind of like another side project of mine, which is like the sunglass industry and uh, kind of how it's really kind of regulated by Luxottica and kind of yeah. the top dogs kind of just control everything. So I thought there was good market to go in there and just, you know, the old high quality product at an affordable price. And it really resonated with people, and that campaign did really well. I think we raised like it was like hundred eighty thousand dollars, which mm-hmm. completely blew me away. I was hoping to like raise like five ten thousand dollars, maybe kind of get a little sunglass business going, and um, that ended up doing really well. So we kind of spun that off, and uh, that was my first uh, e-commerce project. And then about six months later, my dad and I kind of had the idea for this wallet, and we we're like, yeah, we should we should get going on designing like a better version of this. Yeah, so to kind of get the, the actual numbers here, Enclave Eyewear Kickstarter campaign had a goal of $9,700, ended up raising $182,000 from over 3,600 backers. Uh, so it definitely blew away your goal, like you said. Uh, so how did you, maybe we'll start here, how did you, how do you know, you know, you've launched the Enclave Eyewear, um, the Ridge, I guess the original Ridge Wallet Kickstarter campaign, then the Ridge Wallet 2.0, all successfully funded. We can go into details about the the amount raised and everything in a second. Uh, but when you, when you first approach your, your initial Kickstarter campaign, how do you know how much you should be raising how do you calculate that that figure into your your um, I guess your funding goal? Yeah, the initial so the initial figures for me were really just based on the minimum amount I needed to place an order with that manufacturer. Because um, <clears throat> otherwise, they had they have minimums for basically everything. Like the sunglasses, it's like essentially a thousand pairs per mm-hmm. color. Um, <clears throat> I think was our original manufacturer's minimum quantities. So you basically to be able to place an order with them and get like access to like better pricing, you need to be able to place like a larger order. So most of those goals were just based on the minimums that I would need to like actually get something going. Makes sense. So you said that Enclave Eyewear successfully launched. Um, it was your first e-commerce uh, business that you launched. And then six months later, you decided to start uh, to start the Ridge essentially with a new Kickstarter campaign. What was going on at the time with Enclave Eyewear? Like how were you able to balance that and also prep for uh, you know, a totally different um, product, uh, you know, new brand, uh, you know, I'm assuming you have different manufacturers. Like how were you able to balance the, the two? Yeah, it was um, it was actually a lot of work. That was during my senior year of college too. Was uh, so we funded the Enclave campaign was the summer going into my senior year, and then the Ridge campaign was about halfway through my senior year of college. So that was uh, that was a pretty pretty busy year for me. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was just a lot of time management, just making sure that I kind of allotted like getting up at a certain time, making sure you get your schoolwork done and like still having kind of a social life. Uh, it was really just about making sure I got in there. I had a coffee shop I'd go to uh, or the library on campus and I'd just dedicate some time to like getting some work done on the campaigns. And uh, I had also, once it got to be a little too much with, between school and the campaign, I had one of, uh, one of my really good friends from back home start taking over uh, a lot of the emails. And he's actually the one who works, it's both of us working on it every day to day. So he's kind of been brought on as full time over the years. Very cool. So, um, Enclave Eyewear was it? Was the uh, campaign already uh, completed? And did you already fulfill all the orders? And was like an e-commerce shop going already? Like, how much I guess uh, was in motion by the time? So I'm trying to get an idea. You know, someone that launched launches a business and they maybe they have like a day job or they're working part time. It's already enough kind of going on. How much did you have going on with Enclave? Like, was it already humming by then? Cause I can't imagine that you can do that much, you know, in six months, maybe, maybe you're a superstar and you, you did, you were able to establish things by then, but like how, uh, I guess not as you're mature, but how much of your business was kind of set up and going by the time you decided to launch the, the, the Ridge? Yeah. Um, so I'm just looking at our campaign updates right here. So we were, so pretty much I had the Enclave campaign, I had it all kind of timed out where all the sunglasses were going to be delivered during winter break. 
And that was sort of like our time to shine. Like, so it was like kind of like get done with school for the quarter, get back home. All the sunglasses were there. Um, had my family, my friends. We just got a system going and we got everything shipped over those like two weeks. And during that time, I kind of already had the, uh, the Ridge campaign sort of ready to go. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of downtime in uh, running the Kickstarters. Once you've completed the campaign and you've finalized everyone's color selections and whatever you need to get from them, whatever info and their shipping info, then you have the production start. And then you have a couple months of not really anything you can do. Stuff sort of out of your control. Uh, so waiting for the stuff to be delivered was really the time when I was working kind of on having the Ridge campaign prepped. And then once the sunglasses arrived, we made we worked really hard on getting everything shipped. And then once that was all kind of completed, uh, sort of by the end of December, we got all the sunglasses shipped. And then it was uh, late January, early February, we kind of started the Ridge. Mm, very cool. Okay, so you, when you um, were preparing for the Ridge launch, and I look, I talk about the details now. It was a twelve thousand dollar goal, ended up raising two hundred sixty seven thousand dollars from over five thousand or from five thousand three hundred and five backers. So definitely another awesome, successfully funded campaign. Was it easier to launch a successful Kickstarter now that I guess the second time around, like were you able to use any of the um, maybe customers from Enclave Eyewear or was it pretty much a brand new kind of start? Um, yeah, it definitely helped. And I sort of had some insight into the process because I mean, when we started the first Enclave campaign, I didn't know what was possible on Kickstarter. I, I, I completely blew me away. I didn't, I don't know, was not expecting to get that kind of support. Um, and then going into the Ridge, I kind of knew what was possible and if it was a product people wanted. So we did send out an update to all of our sunglass backers and um, it's sort of a different product. So there's not a huge amount of overlap, mm -hmm. but that definitely did help kind of get the campaign going first. Makes sense. So um, when you launched this uh, campaign, and maybe you can talk about Enclave Eyewear success too, but particularly uh, with the Ridge, how did you um, get that kind of, how, like, how did you market it? How did you promote the, the campaign to, to kind of blow past your goals so, so easily? Um, the Kickstarter success really had a lot to do uh, with just Kickstarter's organic popularity. They have, um, I don't know, I don't know how it's set up now. I actually haven't really been on Kickstarter a lot over the last like six months to a year. But uh, at the time, they would take the projects that were new and getting a lot of traffic and a lot of organic reach by just people browsing the site. And then that would kind of get put up into the popular list. And that's when you really start to see it take off because you're kind of either featured on the homepage or you're on the popular list when people go to just browse products. And uh, we were lucky enough to get a lot of backers early that liked our products that kind of pushed us into that popular, popular crowd. Mm, makes sense. So in, when you determined the goal of 12,000 here um, for the Ridge, was it also just based on the minimum order, I guess, um, cost for, for the initial run? Yeah, pretty much. Makes sense. Cool. So when, once the uh, the campaign ended uh, for the Ridge, like what, what next? Like how did you, once you... The, the funding is complete. You have the funds. What do you focus on in the first, let's say, week after a Kickstarter campaign is uh, successfully funded and ends? So then it's after the Kickstarter was funded and ended, it's basically time to um, start gathering info from your backers about their selection so you can kind of get manufacturing underway. Because we had more or less like the versions and the colors people wanted, but you still need to get a little more info. So there'd be, we'd send them out like a, a survey and they would give us their shipping address and sort of their final selection as far as color and like money clip or no money clip. And uh, once you get all that info kind of gathered, you can start putting together your order or the quantity you need to order. Cool. So when you when this campaign was running, though, you mentioned that the kind of key to success was being featured by Kickstarter. And that was the case back then. Uh, you, I'm not aware. And I, I guess you, you might not be aware either of how it works today. Uh, but during the campaign at the time, did you promote it at any point or did you kind of just rely on that organic boost from uh, Kickstarter's promotion? Um, we didn't do any ads, any traditional ads like uh, Facebook, Google or anything like that. Uh, we did email a lot of bloggers and um, try a couple of various outlets. I don't know how successful those really were. It was kind of tough to gauge at the time, but it, most of it really was just from Kickstarter's sort of internal <clears throat> system. 
Mm-hmm. So what was the pitch like when you emailed these uh, bloggers and publications? Uh, and did it matter? Did you wait until the f- uh, you you broke your goal, or you know, because there's this idea I've heard about how. Uh, PR, you know, publications and bloggers uh, tend not to care so much about campaigns that are not successfully funded yet, um, and but will pay a lot more attention to the successfully funded ones, kind of almost irregardless of the uh, funding goal. Did you experience this at any point? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I do think it's more of an issue now, just as Kickstarter has become like just more campaigns over time, become a little more, um, a little more saturated almost. Uh, but yeah, we definitely did have some people that just, I don't know, weren't interested or wouldn't really respond much. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one because it really just depends on the product and who you're trying to reach and kind of what stage of the campaign you're at. So it is it is really difficult getting it off the ground because um, who knows how many campaigns people are being contacted about that, like, I don't know, if they're not successful yet, I guess they're kind of, there's less of a story for a lot of bloggers and stuff, which that's really what they're looking for. Let's show some like really unique product. Yeah, that's the feeling that I, or that's what I've heard as well. So um, what what are some things that you learn? You know, well, let, let me go over to the last campaign actually before we ask this question because you've launched three total. We talked about Enclave already. Uh, Enclave Eyewear, we talked about the Ridge, which is, which is the original. And then the Ridge Wallet 2.0, which had a $14,000 goal ended up raising $127,000 from 1500 back over 1500 backers. So again, another successfully funded campaign. So during this entire process since you've had three you've successfully funded three out of three campaigns, what are some things that you learned about maybe the campaign setup, the, the way you communicate with your with the the backers that you uh, I guess got better at or maybe focus more on over time as you launched, you know, the first, second, and then, and then the third campaign? Yeah, really um, transparency, I think, helped me the most with the backers because no matter what, there's going to be setbacks. And I would say probably, like, I'm kind of throwing this out there, I would say maybe 75% of uh, Kickstarter projects are su- successfully funded fall behind like over a year. Mm-hmm. Wow. And um, backers start to get kind of upset if you don't hit your promised dates and there's so many issues you can't possibly foresee everything. Um, so that was the main thing was just being really transparent with our backers and they seemed to be really understanding when there was a hiccup or a little bit of a delay. Most of our stuff went pretty smooth, but um, that was the main thing was just really being honest and updating your backers. And they just want to hear updates. They want to feel like they're a part of the process. And um, as a project creator, you definitely should be able to deliver that. So transparency, I think um, I've heard this as well before from other Kickstarter back or campaign creators that when things do fall behind and they inevitably do fall behind, it seems uh, transparency is the key to making sure that they don't kind of revolt against against you. So is it just how do you do this? Like, is it just through the Kickstarter updates or, you know, you send them emails? Like, what is the kind of method of contacting them and how frequently are you are you were you doing this during the project? It was definitely uh, campaign updates and it wouldn't be super frequently. It would just be whenever there was something good to say or, or bad, I guess, just anytime there was a, there was a big update, like either production was on time or something fell behind, or if I had like updated timelines, I would just send a new update out and just kind of tell people like, Hey, look, this is what's going on. Um, just kind of thank them for being understanding and a part of the process. And people are really receptive to that as long as they kind of, they like kind of having the insight, which is why a lot of people are also backing these Kickstarters is just to kind of get some insight into the process and, kind of see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So what about the actual setup of the campaign itself? Were there like specific videos or images that you found worked better and then you decided to definitely include them in the second or third Kickstarter campaign you, you ran? Yeah, we had, I had a friend from school who was a really good photographer and videographer. He helped put together the videos. Um, so he filmed them, edited them, and kind of had some input on what angles he thought would work well. And I've always just tried to show the product as well as possible, just how, how it works. So people can just like get a feel from a picture, exactly what it does. Um, that's been the most important thing for the Ridge actually is just kind of showing through pictures exactly what our product is and what it does without having too much description. 
That makes sense. So does that mean, uh, does video work even better for that? Or do you usually stick with um, the, the show using pictures? Because you, like you're saying, the the wallet, you know, wallets are, you know, pretty, it seems pretty straightforward, but you have a, not, not a more complicated wallet, but you have a wallet that definitely um, has features in it that might not be, uh, I guess, clear uh, just through looking at it very quickly. So did you focus a lot on, on creating videos for the, um, to demonstrate the product as well? Um, the Ridge actually we use mostly photos right now, uh, just to kind of show what the wallet does sort of that, like on our homepage or sort of like a side angle with the credit cards and the cash on the top. Um, that seems to resonate really well with people and it's sort of been our best performing ad photos or those same ones, um, that people could just kind of see a video or sorry, see a picture and get a snapshot of exactly what it does or what it's supposed to do. And um, people are pretty intuitive. Once they get it in their hands, they kind of fill around with it a bit and kind of get, they learn how to use it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that you don't, you haven't gone on Kickstarter much and it looks like um, the the last campaign was in 2014. Um, Would you launch on Kickstarter, you know, today? Like if you had another product idea or another product um, launch coming up, would you consider going back to Kickstarter to, to, to fund it? Depends what it is. With our current product line, I wouldn't just because um, I don't believe in using Kickstarter as like, I don't know, sort of another like advertising revenue or something. Mm-hmm. I think it really should be used for uh, people looking to start a fresh idea from scratch. And I kind of feel like we're already kind of off the ground and running a bit. So I don't want to like abuse the platform. And I also want to kind of keep our own standalone e-commerce brand. So I've kind of preferred Shopify since we transitioned out of Kickstarter. Mm. So you wouldn't consider, if you had another product line coming out, would you consider crowdfunding or like pre-selling it? Maybe not through um, Kickstarter, but just through your own your e-commerce site or just through some you know, some kind of other crowdfunding launch yourself? Would you do that or, or are you kind of moving away from the idea of crowdfunding, I guess, new uh, product lines? I think we're kind of moving away from the idea of crowdfunding unless it was something totally separate from the wallets or the sunglasses. Um, I would consider it, but we made a decision a while back that we don't want to uh, run any more campaigns for the wallets. Hmm, interesting. Can you, can you elaborate on, on that? Like why, why not? Um, I guess the reason why I'm asking is because I've seen other companies that have, you know, success and definitely the cash flows and a lot of money to invest. Um, but they always go back to Kickstarter or some kind of, uh, maybe not need Google so much, but definitely go back to Kickstarter for new product lines, maybe specifically for the reason that you mentioned, which is as a marketing channel to get awareness uh, quickly. But you said that you made the, you as a team, as a company, made the decision not to go that route. Can you give us maybe your thoughts on that? Because I think it's, um, I haven't heard this conversation I guess come up about when should established brands go back to Kickstarter? Yeah, um, I guess it's just sort of a, personal preference. I feel like if we went back to Kickstarter at this point with the wallets, it would just feel a little, little cheap or we might get a little flack mm-hmm. from people just for uh, like, why are you doing this? You don't like need to do this anymore. You've like raised your, your capital and now you should like go and just kind of transition to more of a traditional business. Um, so I kind of feel like that. It's a bit of preserving the platform for what I believe it's like meant to be. And just the fact that I would prefer to kind of build the brand the Ridge as like a brand is instead of like a crowdfunding kind of product, I would like it to be its own product that kind of stands on its own merit. And uh, I think the growth potential and sort of long-term goal is a lot better reached just on your own website. Yeah, I, I see exactly. I see what you mean because you want to build up an asset that you own essentially and kind of have more control over rather than, I, I guess yeah, I think I'm struggling to come up with the, the the terminology as well. You don't want to kind of water down the brand by always associating it with uh, crowdfunding or Kickstarter campaigns. You want it to be established as a brand of its own. I, I definitely see where you're coming from for that. Um, so speaking of your your uh, store, how did you um, drive like I guess the buzz um, from uh, Kickstarter over to your own Shopify store? Yeah, so we just sort of rolled it over. Um, we put a little link in the top of the campaign when it ended and we began taking pre-orders. So we kind of made our original site on Shopify, uh, which was an awesome platform to start with. Uh, one of my friends from school recommended it to us and <clears throat> we just sent out an email like, Hey, we're not really taking any more, um, orders from the campaign, 
but you can still place a pre-order on our website and those will be fulfilled after the Kickstarter pledges are fulfilled. So we sort of had a little notice on the website saying like, so everything was available for pre-order, but there was a little uh, asterisk like, yeah, all the Kickstarter pledges will be fulfilled first. And uh, yeah, that was a great way just to keep kind of, kind of make the transition from Kickstarter to Shopify. Yeah, so you had a um, a link going to your store, uh, but then on the site you're still taking pre-orders. So you're almost like extending, not the crowdfunding so much, but you're at least extending your your the buzz and actually converting those into into some sales. Uh, how were you able to kind of estimate when those would come out? Because like you're saying, you wanted to focus first on fulfilling the orders from the original backers, but now you're also taking pre-orders. I could imagine it getting pretty, I guess, hectic because now you have to manage almost two different, um, I guess, releases essentially, right? Because now you have two groups of people that are waiting for, for products. Was that a challenge? Yeah, it definitely was a challenge. Um, cause it's kind of, we had a little bit of experience with the Enclave campaign with running a similar system of like accepting some pre-orders after, but it is really difficult. Um, deciding how many you can accept when the stuff will be in, but the good thing was since the campaigns did so well, we were able, we basically used all the money from the campaigns to order extra product. Mm-hmm. So we had more product than we need. So that was kind of like the transition to a standalone e-commerce business. So we were able to order more inventory with that money we had raised. And that was kind of what we were pre-ordering. So we kind of had an idea of what quantities we were getting in and uh, all the product would kind of get here at the same time. But then we work on fulfilling the Kickstarters first. So it wasn't too much of an overlap on the pre-orders, but it definitely was difficult kind of projecting timelines and estimates and all that. Makes sense. Cool. So now on your Shopify site, um, is the you know it's been a couple of years now since I guess the Kickstarter campaign. So I'm assuming most of the not most of the buzz, but the 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 uh, I guess traffic that comes to your site is not so much from Kickstarter anymore. What has been I guess the most um, I guess successful marketing? A channel for you guys uh, to, to drive traffic to your site? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, we're pretty far past the Kickstarter days. We don't really get a whole lot of reference. We still get, it's really cool when we get emails from people like, yeah, I still have my original Kickstarter wallet or um, something like that. But the majority of the traffic is just sort of past that now. Um, the main platforms we use are Facebook and Google, with Facebook and Instagram being our primary traffic driver. And it's been it's been awesome. I, I really like their ad platform. Oh, very cool. So you use um, Instagram uh, ads as well? Yeah. Awesome. Let's talk about this then. So you use Facebook ads, Google ads, and Instagram ads. So out of those um, three, uh, which one, uh, I guess if you had to pick one, like which one would you uh, focus on, on the most, especially for uh, selling the kind of products that, that you're selling? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. So it sort of depends what you want to accomplish. Like just from a pure return and like best performance metric, uh, Facebook is definitely our best performer. But um, if I had to choose one, it might be Instagram because I think that's where you can still sort of drive organic growth the best because you still have um, your reach with all your followers. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on moving forward is really upping our Instagram presence. And But it does cost – Instagram is a little more expensive than Facebook in our experience for displaying ads just because it's a newer platform and probably a little more sought after. Um, yeah. So if it's mm-hmm. from pure metric, Facebook, but from a branding standpoint, I prefer Instagram. Okay. So you said that uh, it depends on your goal. So I, if it was what you mean that with Facebook ads, the it's almost like... Um I guess lower funnel, you're trying to drive someone to click on the ad to go to the product page and actually complete a purchase. But with Instagram, you're trying to just get a brand exposure, get people to be aware of the uh, the rich wallet. Not necessarily, I mean, it'd be great if they do, but the the main goal is not to get the sale immediately. Is that what you mean by depending, the, when you say that it depends on what your goal is? Yeah, I think Instagram's a little friendlier towards organic growth and just sort of branding because um, people are more likely to see your profile. Because like Facebook, you barely get any organic reach anymore on your on your posts. So the ads are kind of one thing and they're great and they're really effective, but that doesn't translate into like a lot of people like looking at our profile and kind of like becoming more like loyal followers or checking us out more often. Whereas Instagram kind of funnels into those ads create followers as well as sales and those followers are really valuable because as we're posting pictures on Instagram mm-hmm. 
we're able to interact with them a lot more. I see. So Instagram has been better for you guys to actually grow, let's say, your following on there, which then essentially means free advertising to them when you post, uh, you know, pictures on your Instagram profile and not you don't have to pay for them to see it. Yeah, exactly. Cool. It makes sense. Awesome. So now what about uh, Google? What has your experience been like? Uh, you're using like AdWords? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we're using Google AdWords. Um, we haven't ventured too much in display um, campaigns. We run a little bit of display campaigns, which are pretty effective, but um, are they're not quite as effective as Facebook and Instagram for us. So that's where we kind of focus most of our ad spend right now. And then the keywords are going really well though with Google. Sort of we hit like metal wallet, aluminum wallet, bridge wallet, um, kind of like RFID blocking wallet, stuff like that, where people are kind of searching for a product like this. Uh, really helps. Mm-hmm. So, what's your um, strategy then for, let's say, uh, particularly with, uh, let's start with Facebook then. For Facebook ads, how do you know what copy to use or what kind of pictures to show? Uh, I guess we'll start there. Like, how do you know what the ad should actually look like? It's really a lot of just A B testing. Uh, we found that we have a couple taglines for the wallet that don't make too much of a difference depending on what like the ad copy is, but what really makes a difference is just the picture. And that okay. kind of makes it or breaks it. So we've had a couple pictures that just perform really, really well. And Facebook has sort of their internal thing where you can put in for a single ad like up to five different pictures and it'll rotate them at first and just find the most effective one for your um, target audience and then sort of shift all the funds to that. So that um, is kind of what we use is we'll get a bunch of different photos, put them in and just see what kind of performs the best and then kind of move forward with that one. Mm-hmm. And what is the, um, the, the, I guess, the testing cycle like? So you uh, launch a Facebook ad, you, you put in the five different images just so that Facebook can rotate through them. How often are you checking these to, I guess, um, choose a winner for that particular A-B test? Mm, not too often. We found, we have, we have actually two main photos we're using right now, um, and we don't stray too far from that. At first, it was every couple of weeks we do it, but it's been, I haven't, I haven't even tested these photos in a couple of months. I'm just kind of confident that these are the best ones we have right now. Um, and maybe like every like three, four months, I'll get a new photo shoot done and just sort of spot check them and make sure these still are performing the best. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So in terms of uh, now the targeting aspect of it, how do you determine uh, how to target the, the ads? We do a pretty broad target um, compared to what a lot of feedback I've heard. And even from talking to like our account manager at Facebook and stuff, uh, we, we do a pretty broad targeting. And that's just sort of been more effective for us. So I'm not sure if that has to do with like just the product in general as a wider appeal or um, just sort of what I would guess. But our targeting is really broad. We just do males, females, age maybe like 20 to 50. And we put in a few interests. Uh, depending on like maybe shopping and fashion, technology, it's probably usually our main, our main target audience. And that kind of broad net tends to do really well. And then we have the Facebook pixel, which tracks everything on the website, conversions, clicks and stuff, and it'll track who's been to our website. And then we can kind of retarget to those people to kind of get more of a interested audience. Yeah, retargeting is definitely um, a must must do essentially because you're just getting such great ROI for uh, showing ads to people that are already interested or know about your product. Uh, so, what about Instagram? I'm not familiar with uh, launching ads through there. Are are there, is the technology uh, not the technology, but are the um, targeting features and the A/B testing features uh, available through there as well? Or you know, what's uh, what can you do? I guess to to refine your campaign when you launch an ad campaign through uh, Instagram. Yeah, so the Instagram ad network is pretty new. They only started accepting that last year. They started showing some ads, and um, they're really kind of, they just switched to algorithm based uh, newsfeed. Yeah. So that'll kind of help target ads a little bit better and kind of make sure it's not flooded or I don't know. But um, it's actually in the same dashboard as the Facebook yep. um, little ad panel there. So it's just another little checkbox. You can choose Instagram or not do Instagram. I like to have separate ads dedicated to Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can have them all in one where one ad will just display on Facebook or Instagram, whatever is more effective. But uh, I prefer to kind of keep them separate so you can kind of monitor how well they're doing compared to each other. Do you find that the different ads um, perform differently, I guess, uh, between Instagram and Facebook? Like, Are you focusing more on a specific style of ads when you are on Instagram versus Facebook? 
Um, no, they're pretty similar to the ads we've been running. Uh, it translates pretty well to what's effective on Facebook. will also be effective on Instagram. Uh, I haven't noticed too much of a difference where it actually affects like what I write or what picture we use. Um, but yeah, Facebook's definitely a little, has been a little more effective. So if you put the ads together, it'll show out all of Facebook because like, um, their internal algorithm shows that as being like more effective. So that's why I kind of split up the Instagram ads. So I have like a dedicated Instagram ad. So I know those are being, uh, delivered on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So you can look at the, um, I guess, metrics uh, separately as well? Yeah. Yeah. And Instagram doesn't have, they don't have a conversion pixel set up yet. So it'll be mainly um, based on clicks. Whereas Facebook, you have the option to optimize for clicks or conversions, but they should be adding that soon. Okay. So, you know, I've seen Instagram ads before and I really like the way that it's done too, because I don't even recognize that it's an ad immediately uh, when I see it because it looks just like content and a lot of ads are done very well. And I've definitely clicked on, I don't think I've made a purchase yet, but I've definitely clicked on different ads I've seen on Instagram. So when you, when I, what I, based on what I've seen as a, I guess a consumer, when I'm scrolling through my feed, there's a, you know, a picture and then sometimes a video. Do you choose, do you go between the, the two? Do you try a video out with, um, with the Instagram ads? Oh, we haven't done any video yet. Uh, we probably will this year start testing out. We've got to get some videos done that are friendly for ads. Um, but no, we, we haven't tested any of that out yet. It's just been static images. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then there's also a call to action available for the uh, the ad itself. Um, I think usually have, what I've seen is just like learn more. Like, Can you customize that kind of stuff too, like the call yeah. to action? Yeah, they have a couple of options. Uh, there's like learn more, uh, shop now is the one we basically use. Because uh, for a product, and then clicking on it will take you to you will basically I think use an Instagram or a web browser and take you to uh, where I guess to your product uh, product page. Like where does it usually? What do you usually drive the traffic? Yeah, we just have a hit home page for most of those okay. ads. Cool. And are you able to track that as well? Because I know like there's always a difficult issue of you know tracking users or tracking potential prospective customers between their mobile device and their desktop. You know, because I found. Uh, well, not I found, but I've heard from a lot of entrepreneurs that people will browse their or do a lot of shopping, you know, not shopping, but browsing at least through their phone. But then the conversion happens uh, on a desktop. Have you found that to be the case as well with your experience um, selling, especially through uh, Instagram ads? Yeah, that's tough to say because um, I don't really know. You kind of trust that Facebook does a good job at. Um grabbing all those conversions and making sure they're like accurately reported. But I guess yeah. at the end of the day, you don't really know, but I just kind of take comfort in the fact that if anything, the ad is just more effective than it seems uh, in the reporting function. Cause yeah, you don't know how many people are like see ad on their phone and then, Oh cool. That's kind of cool. And they remember the name and go like look for it later on yeah. their, uh, their laptop or computer at home. Yeah. That uh, makes sense. So yeah, that, that kind of conversion is pretty tough. To measure, but at least you can know that you're getting at least what they're reporting, and right. if not, the ads doing better. Probably more. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, running the store itself. So I know you. Uh, I think maybe before the recording, you're talking about uh, all the people that were involved. Uh, you started this. Uh, at least you started this with your your. Um, was it was your dad at the time. Like who else? Who's, who's yeah. I guess involved in the? You had a friend that got involved. Like, who, who's on the? I guess the Ridge Wallet team at this point. Yeah. So the Ridge. Um, it started with me, my dad, and one of my really good friends from home. We kind of he started working with us and helping us do everything, and ended up working with us full time. And now he's just kind of a full on partner. Where it's me and him work on the day to day Ridge Wallet stuff, and uh, my dad helps with a lot more of the kind of back end, like accounting, finance and stuff. And we also started last year with a fulfillment company, which has been amazing. So the day-to-day stuff, uh, the ads, the front end, the wholesale is me and my friend Austin. And then we have a company that does our fulfillment and they have been fantastic. So they get all the product just uh, shipped straight to their warehouses. They inventory it. They ship for us. They handle returns. And um, we have a couple reps with them who also help with the initial customer service. So they'll handle like the initial emails and then kind of alert us uh, to how we want something handled or if there's someone they don't know how to deal with and they kind of forward that to us. Well, very cool. So um, what other, okay, can you tell us more about this service and what other kind of services um, do you rely on to, to help you to help you run the business? 
Yeah, so we've actually we've decided um, to keep the team pretty small. It was kind of something we had to kind of make a big decision within the company. Like, all right, do we want to grow this out and have like a big team, and uh, or do we want to kind of keep it small and nimble? And we've kind of decided on the latter. And this company has really helped uh, kind of that process because they can really just take the brunt of the work and it, they handle it really well. And are there any other apps or tools that you uh, rely on to help run the business? Yeah. So we have a lot, a lot of software subscriptions we use. Um, Tell us all. I think the listeners love hearing about yeah. what tools that uh, you, <laughs> so you are using. What we got, we have, so our Shopify integrates with ShipStation then we have our fulfillment company has their own platform that integrates with ShipStation called One that they're building out in-house. Then we have um, Yachtco does all of our reviews, which has been awesome. Um, that's kind of all our reviews on the site. Yeah, I've seen that. I think I saw that you had over 300 reviews. I think that's, a, I guess, amazing number to, to reach. Was it mostly through the automated emails that uh, come with Yapo? Yeah, yeah. So Yapo will um, email people. We have a specified date, about like 25 days after purchase. So they get a couple weeks uh, kind of using the wallet. And it'll just, yeah, it was asking for a review. And so a lot of people are just happy to review that. Um, so yeah, that's where most of ours come from, just emails after, after, after uh, order. So then we use QuickBooks for our accounting. And we have this app that I installed last year, PipeMonk, which actually um, syncs all of our Shopify data to QuickBooks, which has awesome. been unbelievable. Um, it helps with all the refunds, discounts, income, uh, sales tax, and it does the uh, payment processing fees. Then we use 460. If you see on the site, we have a little like shoppable Instagram that we added recently that I really like where it takes all your Instagram photos and makes a feed on your website and you can kind of link it to the product. So whatever products in that specific Instagram photo, people can like click on it and go, go shop it from your website. That's cool. So then, um, it also gives you kind of like social proof with the, uh, products because people use the customers that are shopping and see other people using your, your wallet or posting pictures on Instagram about is that, was that what you use it for? Yeah. Yeah. Basically. So to like, yeah, anyone who has a cool photo that we've reposted or, whatever it'll be they'll kind of be able to see in action or see what it kind of looks like a little better nice anything else we use for communication we use slack and freshdesk freshdesk is our ticketing system where emails and facebook messages kind of get um sent there so we can close tickets or that really helps and slack is just sort of uh internal messaging between our team so we have all the people over at our fulfillment company on here as well as me and austin and my dad so we can all communicate and sort of stay on the same page. And other than that, we use MailChimp. I mean, I'll Google Drive all the time. And that that's most of it. Cool. Awesome. So um, what's in uh, what's in store for the remainder of this year? Any kind of product launches that you guys are working on? Or like what's the, the focus for, for 2016? Yeah, the focus right now is really finalizing the design. That's sort of been a tricky transition that Austin and I have always had to because um, there's basically – there's like product people and marketing people. And I've always kind of been a product person where I just like enjoy improving the product and always kind of like fixating on like what could be better about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but at some point you have to be kind of satisfied with it and then like switch yeah. over to the thing kind of side. So that's kind of been our big push for this year is really finalizing the design. There's a couple last tweaks that I wanted to make. And then um, I think I'm pretty happy with it now. The big this thing is for a new, a new product line or. No, it's product? just kind of improving the existing wallet design. Okay, We've decided, yeah, we're going to just kind of stick with this same design and just make a few improvements. So the main improvements are just upgrading the money clip and rounding out a few corners, making them not quite as sharp and just kind of fixing the aesthetics a little bit. Um, so that would be really nice to kind of have like a finalized, finalized design. And then we can start working on some new colors and materials and... Uh, Really just making sure we have enough inventory in stock has kind of been the big issue over the last six months or so. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much, Daniel. So RidgeWallet.com is the website. That's R-I-D-G-E-W-A-L-L-E-T.com. Anywhere else you recommend the listeners uh, check out uh, if they want to follow along with what you are up to? Um, yeah, you guys feel free. Uh, Daniel at RidgeWallet.com is my email address. Um, if you guys got any questions, feel free to shoot that over. Um, 
sign up for the newsletter. We usually talk about new products and stuff, but that would be more of like, if you're interested, specifically interested in our product, not mm-hmm. just like entrepreneurship in general. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much, Daniel. Yeah, of course, Felix. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com for a free 14-day trial.